Champagne is the benchmark when it comes to bubbles. It's also one of the most luxurious wines in the world. However, Prosecco has overtook its place in terms of the most sold sparkling wine by volume. When you're just getting into wine, it can be confusing. A lot of people clump sparkling wines into champagne and call it all champagne. Champagne is a legally recognized name. It's a wine that can only be made in the region of Champagne in France. I love the snobby clip from Rablo and Waynesboro. I don't believe I've ever had French champagne before. Oh, actually, all champagne is French. It's named after the region. Otherwise, it's a sparkling white wine. Americans, of course, don't recognize the convention, so it becomes that thing of calling all of their sparkling white champagne, even though by definition they're not. Champagne's one of the biggest success stories when it comes to wine and mass market appeal, and I think an article on Wine Searcher highlights the reason behind this. It says, first, all important bubbles, which make it stand out from less exciting wines. Second, the high prices that champagne commands, which make it feel somewhat exclusive and special. And third, two centuries of clever marketing to a willing and highly receptive consumer base. That's true. Among casual drinkers and hardcore wine geeks, I think Champagne is the wine that's most widely desired, wanted. Champagne has such unique, distinctive flavors, and because of the high prices as commands, producers all over the world have tried to replicate Champagne. I have six sparkling wines here from all over the world, including a Champagne. We're gonna see how they all stack up against each other. What makes Champagne and its imitators unique is the style in which it's made. Prosecco is made by fermenting the base wine, like a normal dry wine and then putting it all in a tank and then starting a second fermentation in this huge tank. That's where you get the bubbles from. From there the wine is pushed out, filtered, and bottled. Champagne is made in the champagne method or the traditional method. What happens is you make the base wine, you stick it in a bottle, then you put a little bit of yeast, a little bit of sugar, a second fermentation happens in the bottle. That's where all the fine bubbles come from. The next process, which is labor intensive, is called riddling. Champagne is put with the neck facing down at an angle. This can be done manually or in big, large automated crates, which they call gyro pallets. And the champagne bottles need to be twisted or riddled a little bit, and that loosens up the dead yeast, the sediment, so it goes down to the neck of the bottle. Then after extended time, the wine spins on those lees, those dead yeast cells. The wine is then disgorged, which means the neck is frozen. It's popped out, so all those dead yeast go out. Champagne requires at least 15 months of lees contact before the wine is disgorged and released. And then a little bit of sugar or sweetener can be added. That gives champagne or other sparkling wines the distinction of brute, extra brute, extra dry, dry. If you want a drier style, look for zero dosage or brute zero. That's when no sugar is added disgorgement. Then you have extra brute, brute. Those are gonna be the driest. And ironically, extra dry and then dry are the sweetest styles of sparkling wine. You need that little bit of sugar to balance out the high acidity in these sparkling wines. I actually think not a lot of producers get brute zero zero right. I usually prefer Brut when I like sparkling wines or champagne. You just need that touch of residual sugar. The wine's still dry, but it balances out that sharp acidity. We're going to blind taste these wines, and then as I reveal them, I'll just describe the style, the region that they're from. You ready? Not tasting out of a champagne flute. I like to taste out of a white wine or universal glass so you get all the aromas. That's why I have my Gabriel glass here. I have a link in the description box if you want to check it out. This does work great with sparkling wine. I have to tell you, doing blind tasting videos is incredibly difficult. Emailing all the producers, getting all the samples, putting everything together, but sparkling wine blind tastings are even more stressful because I gotta make sure the wines are cold, therefore they don't explode. Then I gotta wipe off all the dew so it doesn't soak all the bags unevenly. Then I gotta get somebody to pour them. I gotta hurry up because the bubbles will die. <laughs> it's pretty stressful. Let's go with wine one. A lot of baked apple type flavors. A little bit of baked bread type notes, which I like. That's what you're going to get in types of champagne. Those dead lees add some creaminess that adds some of that baked bread type aroma. Sometimes champagne has like this bronze or copper type note, which I get here. Very fine bubbles here. It's got lots of length. It's got that yeastiness that I really like in champagne, that baked bread type flavor. Just a touch of sweetness is a dry one, but I get some of that sweet fruit on the back end. I don't know if this is the champagne. What happens in champagne for the base wines, they have what they call non-vintage, where they have a bunch of different harvests. They have wine sitting in tank. They blend them all together. That's why you get a lot of complexities. You also have vintage champagne, which comes from one single harvest, like traditional dry wines. Sparkling wine producers 
others all over the globe have imitated this. In fact, I have one non-vintage champagne here, and actually a couple of vintage sparklers just kind of even it out, because champagne tends to be more expensive. Good length. The bubbles are dying just a little bit. These wines have all been open for about 10 minutes <laughs> while I hurried up and bagged them, and I had somebody mix them up for me. But I think that's a very good effort. Wine number two. two <laughs> I've always thought when I've done big blind tastings of champagnes before sparkling wines from all the, over the world, a lot of times I usually pick out the champagne because the yeasty notes stick out, but right now these first two are confusing me. I did do a blind tasting video a few years ago with a champagne expert and a champagne winemaker and my friend Fabian Linne, where we blind tasted champagnes from all over the world and all of us got the champagne wrong except the winemaker. I'm saying that because this is more intense, more yeasty, more bready. The yeast and the bread come out more than the fruit. The fruit came out in wine one. This is super hard. Number two, I love the flavors. It has all the yeastiness, the complexity. It doesn't have the sharp piercing acidity, the, the, the sharp tartness that you get with champagne. But whatever this is, I think this is number two is a hell of a wine. It's the morning, but I almost don't want to spit these wines. Well, I used to live in Asia. On Sundays, I'd often go to brunch and we just drink champagne. It's like 10, 11 in the morning. You're gonna get getting toasty on a luxurious brunch and champagne. That's really good. I'm impressed with both of those wines. Two brings the yeastiness of champagne. One brings a lot of the flavors, except a little more fruit. It has the high acidity. I don't know, let's go on to three here. Three right away, I get more of those age type notes, kind of that, um, I get a little of the petrol type notes. Almost that smells like a Riesling. Baked apple, a little bit of petrol, like diesel fuel type flavor. That goes over the yeastiness, but this is super attractive. I do have a German sparkling here, so this, that might be it here. <laughs> Number three tastes like good solids aged Riesling with bubbles, which I like. I've tasted some gorgeous sparkling wines made out of Riesling in Germany. It doesn't have the yeastiness, but it's not a simple fruity sparkler. In fact, I really like it. That's good. Oh, it's sharp. Ah, oh, yeah, so that is Riesling heads. I think that's the, I do have a Riesling sparkling here, so I think that's it. Four does not have the yeastiness. It's more of like an apple pear type flavor. Keen's Asian pear, if you ever had Asian pear or even type of a yellow pear type flavor. A little bit of lemon. It's more fruity, I don't get as much yeastiness. Four is very good. It doesn't, when I want champagne, I want that baked bread, that yeasty type flavor. Four is more of like a fun sparkling wine, a little more complex, actually a lot more complex than a normal Prosecco, but it's more of a fun sparkling wine a lot of people are gonna like. I have to admit, when I first started drinking wine, I didn't love champagne. It took a while for me to get into it. The high acidity, I just, and I, I felt like, oh, all champagnes kind of taste the same, which is not the case. When you go to champagne, you start tasting the differences between houses or the different wines within the portfolio, then you start to notice a difference. But this is fun. Five just shows balance. Not too much fruit, not too much apple, top, too much white pear, not too much baked bread, not too much croissant. It's just everything kind of comes together nicely. It's fruity on the back end. It doesn't have as much of that yeastiness that I like. I, I keep repeating that. That's what I want, want love, crave, and champagne. <laughs> but it's just, nothing sticks out. It's just a nicely balanced wine. Six smells good. Six has like this kind of slaty mineral hit. One and two had a ton of yeastiness, like when you go into a fresh bakery in France and it's coming out at you. This is more like day old bread. Get a little bit of apple, a little bit of pear. Just balanced, nice sharp acidity. It's really, really good. Let me just double check a few real quick. When you're blind tasting, you can really mess yourself up. A lot of times you should just go with your first instinct. So I'm not gonna try to, I'm just gonna tasting here for quality, not saying which one is champagne or not. <laughs> okay, I think I might know which, which one between two of them are champagne. You ready for the reveal? All these wines are excellent, different in their own rights. You gotta know what you want, what you like. You gotta pay attention to your palate. Let's start out with number four. I think it was straight fruit. It was the least yeasty out of all these wines. It was still very fun. Had good length, good structure. Like I said, even though it wasn't yeasty like I want in traditional champagne, it was super good. 90 points. Let's take a look here. Let's take a look and see. Wow. 
<laughs> so 90 points and this traditionally is a wine that I've always thought has been one of my favorite, my, the best sparkling wines outside of Champagne. It's a Penedès Classic, which is from the region of Catalonia, which surrounds Barcelona in Spain. Penedès Classic is not Cava. A lot of producers have separated from Cava. Producers have started a, a group called Corpinat, make top end sparkling wines. Then this one is kind of the heads of Penedès Classic. In Penedès Classic, the grapes have to be organic. They have to be aged at least 15 months on the lees. This is a vintage sparkler that's aged for 30 months on the lees. This is the Ravento Blanc de la Finca 2019. This comes in at 36 bucks, 60% Cerello, 25% Macabeo, 15% Perellada, which are common grapes you're gonna see in Cava. 36 bucks, very, very nice wine, very good producer. They also produce an affordable wine called the Blanc de Blancs, which is also vintage. That wine comes in 2021 20, bucks around the world. I thought this would finish number two. Still very, very good, but I'm surprised it was so fruity compared to these others. That's weird. Let's go on to number six here, also tied with 90 points. Number six was balanced, so it had the fruit, but remember I said it was kind of like day old bread as opposed to one and two, which was like you walking into a bakery. Thought it was very good, balanced, 90 points, a lot of fun. Let's take a look here. I want to see how many of these I got. Wow. So I am very impressed. So this is a Prosecco, but Prosecco, you can make it with the tank method, which I talked about earlier. This is made in the champagne method, and this was incredibly balanced. Uh, this is a vintage. This is the Belanda Valdo Biadene DLCG Prosecco Superiore Extra Brut 2020. This comes in at 28 bucks. The wine name is called Se Uno, made from the grape Glera. <laughs> Glera is the main grape used in Prosecco. I'm really shocked by this. If you want to look for higher end Proseccos, look for Valdo Biadene. It'll say Prosecco Superiore on it. This did not taste like a normal Prosecco. I thought this was good. 28 bucks, that's a good deal. Balanced, it was delicious stuff. That's very good. That's so funny, I thought that number four would be the Prosecco, but you know, that's how it goes sometimes with blind tasting. Wow, I'm surprised. Number five was also just, it was fruity came out and it was balanced. Not maybe six was like where everything was all just kind of put together. Number five, it was just a little bit more fruity, but had yeastiness. The yeastiness didn't stand out like over the fruit. I gave it 91 points. I thought it was delicious. Um, I'm really excited to see where I'm at here. This is a Cap Classic from South Africa. Cap Classics are sparkling wines made in the traditional method in South Africa. In the past, they only had to be aged nine months on the lees. Now legislation's changed up to 12 months, so the better producers do more. Like this one was 60 months on the lees. This is the Graham Beck Blonde Blancs 2018, made from 100% Chardonnay. This comes in at 37 bucks. Exceptional wine. I mean, all these wines were, were super, super good. South Africa delivering ridiculous value for money. Graham Beck sent me a big selection of wine, so I'm excited to taste through all of them, including their basic Brut, their Cap Classic, that comes in at like 20 bucks. The good thing about all these wines, I just loved the bubbles in all of them. Number three, also tied, 91 points. I do have a German sect in here, so I think that it is the German sect. Let's just have those Riesling type notes. That's what stood out the most. So, Germans are, I think, some of the biggest consumers of sparkling wine in the world. I think I saw that on average per capita, the average German drinks five bottles of sparkling per year. And if you think about not everybody drinks sparkling wine, that's all, you know, the people that are drinking sparkling wine are drinking a lot of it. This is the Vau Rangauer Reserve Brut, made from Riesling. I do not know how long this is on the lees. Weird pricing system in, in the in Germany, it's like 23 euros. I think they're trying to enter the US market. So I'm guessing if it was 23 euros, probably be about 38 bucks by the time it gets here. This is a delicious wine. If you're a Riesling nut like me, just age Riesling notes with fine bubbles. German sect is a funny category. For basic sect, they can actually import grapes. They need to be aged for at least nine months on the lees. Then you have higher quality German sects, including those from the VDP, which is an exclusive organization of some of Germany's finest producers. The sparkling wines in that category have to be aged for at least 24 months on those dead lees. Okay, the top two were the most yeasty wines in the bunch. I think 
I might know what the champagne is, um, but we'll have to see. Let's go with wine one. Wine one had very fine bubbles, length, bread, baked apple notes. The only thing for me that was holding it back a little bit, all these wines were in the cups for quite about the same amount of time, 10 minutes right before I shot this video. These bubbles were probably falling down the most out of all these wines. But still, I thought with flavor, I thought it was outstanding. I gave it 92 points. And let's see if I get the champagne right. Please, get the champagne right. Let's see, did I get the champagne right? So, this is from California, made by a champagne producer. There's a lot of champagne producers like Tettinger, Piper Heidsek, working in California, especially around Carneros, the southern end of Napa Valley, to make sparkling wine. I think the most memorable sparkling wines from California that I've had have been the Ultramarine. I think that's the name of it. It's a cult sparkling wine. It's good, but it was a little bit overpriced. And Schramsberg, some of their stuff that's aged in the lees is good. This is ridiculous value for money. This is the Piper Sonoma. Blanc de Blancs. So this is made of Chardonnay. I think there's some Pinot Blanc in here. This comes in at 22 bucks. There's no real regulations for California sparkling wines, although the best producers are going to try to keep it on the lees as long as possible. 22 bucks. This is non-vintage. I thought this was excellent, except the bubbles, like I said, were not as good as, as I'd like to, but the flavors were all there. I actually thought that that might be the Revento C. Blanc de la Finca. So what a value. Okay, the top wine. Luckily, I was able to pick out the champagne. It stood out. This wine, because I knew what the wines were beforehand, I poured them out and then had somebody mix them up for me. I was so impressed with this champagne. I do a collector's dinner every single month with some of my wine collecting friends, and we did a champagne evening one time with a lot of grower champagnes, vintage champagnes, small producers, and this is a big house. And this was one of the wines of the night. Everybody, including me, thought it was excellent. I posted about it on Instagram, and then they reached out and they said, hey, you want some samples to taste? And this showed the best. The most yeasty, the most bready. The bread, that's why I liked it more than fruit. It's so funny because it wasn't sharp like normal champagne. I gave it 93 points for a non-vintage <laughs> sparkling wine. This spends at least 24 months on the lees, although it's non-vintage. Funny enough, all these were brute, except the Prosecco Superiore was extra brute. This is the Piper Heidsek Champagne Brute. 49 bucks. Made up of three main grapes of champagne. This is made of Meunier, Pinot Noir, and Chardonnay. Uh, what? What a wine. What a tasting. So tell me, do you have any affordable alternatives to champagne? Any other sparkling wines you like? I'd love to hear. Drop it in the comments below.